Hey everyone, we're back here again at the New England Wireless and Steam Museum in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. As part of our introductory series to this year's annual Steam Up event that we're being forced to hold on YouTube, hold virtually on October 3rd, I've always wanted to explain better in depth uh, quite how the Coros valve technology works. And that's something that we were going to have to get to at a future point in time. But unfortunately, to get to that point in understanding why Coros was such a big leap forward, we have to understand a little bit better how the older technology works. So here, our American ball engine, you can see I've got the valve cover removed from the steam chest. We'll get back to that one in a minute because that's actually a very unique case. Um, but I've done the same thing on several of the other engines around here tonight. Um, here, our Isabel Porter, one of the, the larger of our two Isabel Porter engines inside the steam chest. Now, for anyone not familiar with it, it's exactly why I want to do that. This chamber here, uh, typically seen as this large rectangular box on the side of any sort of a, a steam engine, is called the steam chest, uh, so-called because the steam from the inlet valve comes in through the pipe here and fills this chamber with steam at all times. And the way that the valve works is this little sliding door that's right here. This one's quite rigid, we can't get it out, but you see that it has exposed a slot right here that will let the steam from this chest, the steam chest, travel into that end of the cylinder. That passage is connected to the outer end of the cylinder here, letting it fill that with steam and push the piston that way as it does its work. Let's see, this one, it's gonna close as we rotate the, uh, the crankshaft here. This engine is in rough shape. It hasn't seen any steam in a long time. Um, and now you see it's changed position to expose a slot at the other end of the chamber, now letting any sort of uh, the steam pressure that's in the steam chest flow into that slot, fill the back side of the cylinder, and push the piston back again the other way. Now there's one little piece of this puzzle that's not very well told by what you see here, in that the back side of this door actually serves a purpose. It has a concave cavity on it that allows, that connects the slot that we just saw to a slot in the middle that forms the exhaust. We can see it a bit better on an engine over here. Our Clark and Howard riding cutoff engine, which is another whole chapter that we can get into. But you can see inside of the Clark and Howard valve chest, steam chest, that we have the three slots that I'm talking about. Let me try to uh, come up a bit here. There we go. Um, the three slots. So the uh, slot at the top is connected to the top end of the cylinder. The slot at the bottom is connected to the bottom end of the cylinder. And the slot in the middle is the exhaust port. And this chamber, again, the steam chest, would be full of steam at all times. And we have the valves sitting right here. Now, these valves quickly come out and you see that this one has two slots in it but here is that concave cavity that I was showing you in the back that connects uh, each one of the ends of the cylinder to the exhaust port as it slides back and forth. Now this engine uh, has what's called a riding cutoff on it. It's got this extra plate that rides on the outside that changes the uh, duration of steam admission uh, with another uh, input from the governor there. It's a slightly more complicated thing and an attempt at variable cutoff. Still not as efficient as the Coros design, but again, we'll get into that at, uh, a little bit later, a little more in depth. These pieces just slide right back into that, uh, that valve cavity there. So uh, make this made that one very easy to take apart and demonstrate. Something very similar on our uh, Sears and Roebuck engine here, the Kenmore engine. Um, you can see there's a slot that's exposed at the top here. And again, our steam chest, steam fills this cavity. This uh, casting that you see here is nothing more than um, a pressure plate to be able to keep it tight against the uh, inside of the cover. 
And as we rotate the engine, you'll see the cross head, which is the, the piece here, um, connected to the piston inside and the connecting rod down to the crankshaft. You'll see that begin to drop. Piston's now close to top dead center and it's letting steam into the top side of the cylinder from the steam chest through that slot into the top. As we come up past top dead center, that position reverses and now the valve here is connecting that top end to the exhaust to, uh, to let it vent. As the piston goes down and exposes the bottom side, let me see, let to take a quick look at this. Ah, so I was actually spinning it the wrong way. Um, you see, now we allow it into, to fill the top. It pushes the piston down. As the piston gets close to bottom dead center, the door on the bottom side or the slot on the bottom side becomes exposed, allowing it to fill the lower side of the piston with the uh, steam, push that piston back up, and keep repeating the cycle. Now, let's take a quick walk over to the American Ball engine, because that is a very different case, and something that I was honestly very surprised to see when I first discovered it myself. So, in this here, let's see, again, might appreciate the American Ball engine built by the American Engine Company. So it's actually an American engine, and Ball is uh, the type of design that it is. And that specifically re refers to this particular section right here. Again, you might normally call this the steam chest, and I'm sure the designers of the time all called it the same thing, but this particular engine, the Ball type engine, um, reverses the entire situation. Um, in that the chest is no longer a steam admission chest, but rather an exhaust chest, an exhaust passage. So live steam comes in through the valve here, comes down through the top of this casting, gets delivered to this ball that then slides back and forth and steam flows through the ball to the admission port on either one end of the cylinder or the other, which flows down through this slot and through the casting. It's an incredibly complex casting here. Through the casting and out into one end of the cylinder. And that all reverses. Um, now, I've actually I've pointed at that incorrectly because it's actually flowing through the ball and into this end of the cylinder to push the piston back while this end is exposed to the inside of the cavity. Again, this becomes an exhaust chamber on this particular engine, letting the uh, spent pressure be pushed from this end of the cylinder out through that passage into the chamber and down the exhaust. I can understand why someone might, at some point in time, have mislabeled the, the rotation on this engine because the valve oscillation is completely backwards from the standard uh, type oscillation because of that system right there, because of the reversed functionality of that system. So hopefully we can get into each one of these a bit more as time goes on and you will see all of these engines operate in the course of the coming weeks, particularly on October 3rd at our steam up day. And we hope you can join us all then back here at the New England Wireless and Steam Museum in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Thanks for watching.